What's going on, people? Welcome to United View and welcome to another video with your latest Manchester United transfer news. I'm joined by a very special guest coming onto the channel for the very first time, ESPM's Manchester United correspondent, Rob Dawson. Mate, how you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, no worries. No worries. Thanks for coming on. I think, uh, well, I hope you can shine some light and make us smile, Rob, to be honest with you, mate, because it's been pretty bad. It's been pretty bad. Slow start to the window. And I'm sure the United View community want to want to pick your brains on a lot of stuff. So I'm going to do my best to kind of represent them well and answer questions I think they will want to hear about. Um, Rob, I want to start straight away on Frankie de Jong. Frankie de Jong, not going to butter it up. Is it a done deal? Is this deal done? I don't think it's done yet. I think the expectation is from both sides that it will be eventually. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he was on the flight to Thailand on July 8th. Obviously, that said, and you know, United fans won't need me to tell them this. It's only done until he's stood on the pitch with a, a shirt and a scarf above his head. Um, you know, United fans don't need me to come on here and start saying, "Oh, yeah, you know, they're working hard, it's progressing and all that." They want to see that it's done. Um, you know, I'm well aware of the frustration that's uh, you know going on among the fan base, and I can understand that perfectly. Um, you know, United are talking to Barcelona. There is confidence on all sides that that will get done. Barcelona want to sell him. United want to sign him, and in that situation. You know, usually the outcome is that the player moves clubs. Obviously, there is a little bit of an issue in that Frankie de Jong, we're told, isn't overly keen or wasn't overly keen at one stage because he wants to play in the Champions League. He likes it at Barcelona, he likes it in Spain, wants to stay in the Champions League. But, you know, once a, a club make it clear that a player has to move, it, you know, he, he hasn't got that many options. And as I say, I think it's eventually this will get done. I think um, there is a growing feeling amongst United fans, but... the. the... The frustration has definitely been there. You alluded to it. I, lo I love your tone on that in terms of, like you said, United fans don't need me to come on here and say they're patiently working and this, that and the other. You know, I did some, I did a bit of research and, and, a, and, a, and a piece with Semra Hunter from um, from the Liga TV and she was given a perspective that actually Manchester United have played this the correct way. From your point of view, uh, do you think Man United have played this the correct way? Yes, us as fans are frustrated. We wanted him earlier. And like you said there, you wouldn't be surprised if he boards the plane to Bangkok, which actually is the main thing. He needs to be there before. But do you think the Man United actually, in hindsight, once this deal does get done, they actually played their cards right? Or do you agree or see the frustration in the fans at, at the lack of activity from United on this? Yeah, I mean, I can see it from all sides, to be honest. I can understand that United fans are frustrated. I think part of that is framed by what City and Liverpool have done. You know, if City hadn't done anything and Liverpool hadn't done anything, I'm not sure the frustration would be at the level it is now. But obviously, City have gone and done Phillips and Haaland and Liverpool have signed Nunes. Um, and United were already behind. And, and in, you know, framed against that, it does look bad. You, you've said it there, though, that the important thing is that he's on the plane to Bangkok. You know, if he's missing two or three games of the season because this isn't done sort of well into August, then that's a different matter. But ultimately, he's played in the Nations League games anyway with Holland. He would still be on holiday. If he was signed, he wouldn't be at Carrington today anyway yeah um that said you know this is meant to be the start of a new era um it was a fresh start fresh manager fresh people coming in and um, different people doing the, the recruiting and united fans for a long time have been asked to have faith you know faith that everything's going to get better and things will get done and you know more often than not over the last 10 years that faith hasn't really been rewarded so that i think united fans are at a point now where it's like i don't we don't care now we just want to see him on the pitch with a scarf or wearing the shirt actually playing because they haven't got faith that these things are going to get done because they've heard all this before. You know, they've heard that they're, they're tracking players and, you know, they want this player and, you know, player A is going to transform the midfield or player B is going to transform the front, front line and it's not happened. And, and I can understand that. And United you know, fans just want to see that this, whatever this is, this new era is, is off to a, a positive start. Um, you know, from United's point of view, I've just mentioned there that, you know, it's it's not a case of just you go out and get a player. It's, it's just, it's not that easy. And I think part of the problem is that I don't think the United's budget is as big as perhaps United fans think. Um, and, you know, United do have to, to look after the, the pennies and the pounds a little bit. You see a lot on Twitter that United should just, just pay the money, just do it, just pay the money. And I can understand that because they want the player in. But United are working to a, a pretty set budget and... You know, paying 10 million over the odds for, for Frankie de Jong or 10 million more than you're expecting means that they can't then go and put 10 million into another player or, you know, a further 10 million into a, a different player. So it does have a knock on effect. Um, and now I'm not going to, I wouldn't say United have played this perfectly. I think you'll, you're only going to know when he, when he signs. You know, if he's exactly. on the plane to Bangkok with, for a reasonable fee, 
then fair play. You know, you've done it. He's in. You've got your main target. Your main priority for the squad has been filled. You know, and then maybe is a time to, to talk about it. Uh, it's difficult because, I, again, I can understand the frustration of, of Man United fans completely. But, you know, it's difficult to judge a transfer window until you get to September 2nd and you can actually see what's been spent, who else has spent, who else people have brought in and what United have actually got in the squad. Absolutely. I, I remember, you know, you think back to last uh, transfer window. Yes, the defensive midfielder situation kept rambling on and we said we didn't get it. But I think most Manchester United fans said, well, we've got Sancho, Varane and Ronaldo here. I'll tell you what, Ollie, you better, better give us a title challenge. You know, that, that's what it was. It wasn't yeah. look at the awful window we've just had. Um, so it is. It's, it's, it, and that was, you know, we unveiled Varane on the pitch and before uh, once the season already started. We got Ronaldo just before the Wolves game. Um, uh, sorry, for the Newcastle game. So, yeah, uh, that, I, I hear what you're saying there. You spoke about there about United are working to, you know, a set budget. We've heard reports on this. I know, obviously, the video that Richard Arnold was in, United would not have wanted it to come out in that way. And I think he dealt with that the best he could, given the situation he was in, whether he's come out, you know, looking better with a little bit of respect from some fans and, and some people saying a bit naive. There's a lot There's a lot of different different opinions on that. But... In your, how you understand it to be, what is United's set budget? Do you know? I don't know a set figure. I mean, we, we are led to believe that it's between about 100 and 150 million net, which means that there will be money there to spend. Mm. Anything that comes in from, from outgoings will get back, put back into the pot. Um, you know, it, it's difficult in that, you know, when you're trying to do these signings, it's, it's, not, a, it's not like the manager or the director of football has been given 120 million and that if you are a penny over 120 million, you can't do it. You know, there are, there are targets who they believe are attainable for a certain price. Now, you know, obviously there's lots of things that go into that. You know, it's what United are willing to pay, what the, the selling club are willing to accept, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're led to believe the budget is between about 100 and 150 million net. What has been impressed upon us by United is that this isn't going to be a 300 million pound rebuild in one summer. Um, they weren't particularly impressed with Ralph Ragnick saying in a press conference that it could be 10 new players because it's just not going to be. 10 new players you know you're talking about you know maybe 400 500 million to, to, to buy 10 new players it's just not going to be that um united usually work to a plan of around about three ins three outs now that is a little bit different this summer in that they've had a lot of players come to the end of the contracts at the same time the likes of paul pogba jesse lingard Nemanja matic matter of have all gone so you know you can make a case that maybe they need more than three even just to make up the numbers um yeah. so it's it's not a, it's it, it's not a finite you know a set rule with with this kind of thing but as i say we are led to believe the budget is between about 100 150 million net and i thought it was in, you know there was a lot of talk about united and nunez before he went to, to liverpool and united was certainly in for nunez one of the reasons and there were a few reasons but one of the reasons why they pulled out of that is that they felt that the nunez deal would have taken too big a chunk out of their budget to do what else they wanted to do for the rest Great. of the summer yeah now he went for what 65 million down up to about 85 million so that's the kind of numbers that you're looking at for signings that they didn't think that they could do that and then go and do De Jong, who is the, the primary target this window. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea about what the money is, where it is and, and where they're hoping it's going to go. Yeah. Um, and before we move on from De Jong, I think it's fair to say you just kind of touched on it there. This absolutely is Eric Ten Hag's primary target. And, and do you feel that that's the reason why Manchester United... We're not hearing too much about, you know, final stages or even advances for any other players at the moment. Yes, we'll get to Anthony, we'll get to other incomers potentially. But do you feel that that's the reason why Man United haven't kind of moved past the stumbling block? Because Eric Ten Hag made it so clear that I don't care even if it takes till deadline day, get me Frankie de Jong. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's identified that the, the centre of midfield is his number one area to strengthen. Um Frankie de Jong is someone that he he knows well, obviously, from Ajax, that they've been buoyed a little bit by what Barcelona have said, that they are willing to, to sell him because they need to raise their own money to solve their own financial problems. Um, you know, they think that they've had enough encouragement from de Jong to keep pursuing it. This isn't going to be a case of, you know, you finally agree a deal with Barcelona and then he turns yeah, around and goes, right, right. right. no, I'll see you later, mate. <laughs> um, so I, I, they've been given enough encouragement from his representatives that, that he is willing to to talk about it and to come if it is all agreed. And yeah, you know, there are other targets for the midfield area, but he is someone that, that Eric Ten Hag really, really wants to a point where they are willing to throw pretty much everything at this to see, you know, to make sure that they can get it over the line. The, the, the other one 
which is a little bit different is Ericsson in that he wouldn't require a, a transfer fee. You know, um, he's obviously available on a free transfer if he decides to come to to Manchester. So it's it's not a case that that takes a massive amount out of the the budget to sign players. Obviously, you'd have to pay in wages, but you know they have saved a lot on wages anyway with the the departures that we've already mentioned. So yeah, um, in terms of other players coming in for big fees, yeah, you're right. You know, they they have to get De Jong over the line, and then they'll see what else is left. And maybe they can go and do Anthony, or maybe they can go and do someone else. But it will be about what is left in the budget after De Jong signs. Yeah, um, and you know, moving on to that, it was it was about more incomings. We're hearing loads about Anthony. We're hearing loads about Lissandro Martinez. Um, we're hearing that you know Ten Hag wants to look at fullback, the situation there at fullback, and and strengthening that position if possible. Um, the domino effect really is what my question is. How what do you, do you think there will be? A domino effect once that first Frankie de Jong domino falls what sort of turnaround do you think it'll be in terms of other deals coming in who do you think they'll be yeah I mean you know United have, I've seen lots of stuff in the past about United's kind of working on one and then you know waiting till that was done and then not working on anything else until that one's done and, and you know there is a little bit of truth in that but it's not a case of you know they don't look at anything else until one deal is done and then they you know all the, all this other work is going on behind the scenes and they are working on players like Anthony obviously they want to get De Jong over the line and things may free up once that happens because Ten Hag has said that he wants the centre midfield sorted before he sorts everything else. We were told that the priorities for Man United this season were, or this summer, sorry, were a central midfielder and then a forward. The forward, the, the targeting has, has shifted slightly after Nunes went to, to Liverpool in that they, they're not now looking for an out-and-out -out number nine. They're looking for a more versatile forward who can play across a number of different positions because they think that you know, they've got Marcus Rashford who can play up front or Anthony Marshall, if he stays, can play up front. So they're, they're, they're kind of covered there. They want someone who can play across the front and Anthony fills that that void. Obviously, again, someone that, that Eric Ten Hag knows well. Um, there is a little bit of a problem with, with valuation in that United value him around about €40 million Euros and Ajax value him around double that. And that's a massive gap for, for a player like that. Yeah. You know, Ajax, yeah, Ajax are under no pressure to sell because... Um, they've, they've already sold players in this window, um, so they don't need the money particularly. Things may change if Anthony kicks off, really. You know, that he has been quite clear, I think, privately, that he wants to go to United if that opportunity arises. It's whether he then goes to Ajax and says, look, I want to go to United, this opportunity won't come around again, I'm, I'm going, please can you let me go? And that gives Ajax a problem to solve. So, um, you know, after they've got the central midfield sorted and you know after they've you know solved the, the issue that they've got up front there may be there may be room for for other signings you know we were told that it was a midfielder then a forward and then possibly a defender what that defender looks like i'm not sure whether it's a center half whether it's someone to cover the fullback positions because out of all the outgoings the ones that are left pre predominantly are defenders the likes of eric Bailly, um axel twanzebi you know possibly aaron wampasaka possibly alex teller so um, you know, Brandon Williams is another one. So if you, if you were to lose all of them, which I don't think they will, but if you were to lose all of them, then again, you would need you would need cover in certain positions, and and it would be about what is left in the budget to to fix that. Yeah, I can see. I can definitely see that. I mean, the need for a forward. I, I get if we want if we want more in that area. Fullback really concerns me. Centre back really concerns me. Um, be interesting to see how to Eric Ten Hag does in that area but definitely I think it seems to be more about the budgets if we, if we talk about outgoings I know there was a lot I mean you was one of the first to sort of start talking about it um off the back of a couple last in the last few days or so especially last week about the Ronaldo situation it seems to have calmed itself down now but certainly I think a lot of Man United fans were thinking I'll tell you what we could we're in massive trouble if he leaves um how do you understand that situation for you in terms of a possible outgoing for, for Ronaldo? Has that settled itself down? Is it just more of a, a frustration aspect from him because he's looking around that dressing room or looking around the club and saying, you know, what are the club doing to try and sort out the mess from last year? Or was there genuine or is there genuine um, intent, do you reckon, from Ronaldo to, to look elsewhere? Yeah, I think there is, there is genuine frustration on his part that he is at a stage of his career where he wants to be winning as many trophies as possible and there are doubts that United is the place to do that I, I don't think that his love of the club is is in doubt no. or you know he's, he's certainly not gonna I wouldn't have thought he was gonna force a move or anything like that but th this is this is no different to what he did last summer 
you know, his agents were around last summer sort of gauging interest. You know, they went around to United, they went to City, Real Madrid, and just said, look, you know, what do you need? Could you fit him in? What do you reckon? And that gives you a decent idea of what your options are. If there are no options there, then, you know, it, it doesn't, there's no decision to make. Um, if there are options there, then, you know, maybe you sit down and discuss it and are we better off at, at this place or are we better off staying where we are? And I don't think it's, you know, it's anything sinister particularly. It's just something that happens in the summer um, with with top players, particularly a player like Ronaldo, who is 37 years old and is, I think it's fair to say, he's not looking forward to playing a season in the Europa League. I think that's, mm. you know, fair for him to think. Um for the first time over the weekend, United were very, very clear, though, about their stance on him in that he's got at least a year left on his contract, that he wasn't for sale. The phrase that was used was that they want and expect him to stay next season. Um, and that's about as hard a stance yeah. as you're going to get at this stage. Um, you know, Ultimately, that should be the end of it. But it's Ronaldo, so it probably won't be the end of it. Um, wow, and, 100%. Well, and, you know, it is. And you, you, ultimately, you can't blame him. You know, this is a guy that, that is used to winning the Champions League. And not only is he not going to play in the Champions League next year, he's not, you know, he's, he's going to be in the Europa League, which is the second tier. And it's, it's a place that he doesn't really feel is, is fitting of his talents. And I can understand that. Um, would he love to what, to, to win trophies at, at Man United, of course, but I think he wants to see a little bit of ambition. Um, I think he was hoping that maybe a few more bits and pieces would have been done and, and he would have a clear idea of what they would look like next season. Um but again, ultimately, look, if United are absolutely set in stone, he's he's not for sale, then they hold all the cards. He's got a contract. They don't have to they don't have to sell him. Um I think it's interesting though that, that part of this is is to do with Ten Hag having to kind of phase this rebuild. Um I don't think that Ronaldo is his perfect centre forward, but I think he's looking at last season and thinking this is one guy who actually did what he was meant to do. He scored <laughs> the goal. Yeah, yeah, so you you need times, need to yeah. score goals. Um you know, why are we getting rid of a guy who scored 20 odd goals when no one else could, could hit the net at all? And, and that is a fair question. I think the same is true with probably David De Gea. Is David De Gea Eric Ten Hag's perfect goalkeeper? Probably not. But is he a massive problem that needs solved right this second? Again, probably not. There are bigger issues to solve. And I, and I think Ten Hag is hoping that he can make a few changes this summer, you know, solve the, the gaps that really are evident, get through next season, you know, hope that he qualifies for the Champions League. Um, and finishes in the top four, and then the following summer get around to solving some of the other issues. I, I think you're probably looking at Ronaldo and De Gea and thinking, in a perfect world, would you be in my team? Possibly not, but it's not a perfect world. So you did really well last year. You're obviously fantastic players. Go and do it again, and we'll sort. We'll we'll talk about you know their position in the squad in 12 months time. Absolutely, I, I agree with what you say, especially on those two. Um, there'll be a few lads. Um, and people that we showed this to, I've uh, been watching the channel, we've been having a lot of debates about uh, David De Gea and, you know, so, some lads on the channel have been saying that, you know, it's time for him to go and he doesn't fit the Ten Hag style of play. And, and me and some others are saying, listen, this is a guy who's got us out of trouble countless times. It's time to show him a little bit of loyalty now um, to see how we can adapt to, to, to Ten Hag. And like you said, in 18 months, two years, I wouldn't give him a new deal, but in 18 months, um, or at the end of this year, you sort of look at it and say, right, okay, what's the next step of the Ten Hag um, evolution? But right now, you don't get rid of the only two constants you have, which is the only two people you can rely on to do their job, and that's Ronaldo and De Gea. So definitely agree with you there, Rob. Um, the rest of the outgoings, though, um, you know, in terms of who's got the most chance, and look, Eric Bay, I think, stupidly signed a new contract under Oli. I don't know how that even happened. Um, he's on quite a big contract. You're looking at the uh, There was some silly rumours about... Maguire being part of that Barcelona deal, didn't believe that for one second at all. Um, but, uh, you know, what other outgoings could we could we expect? I know we've seen uh, Fulham are looking to sort of secure the likes of Andreas Pereira for about 10 million. What else can we expect? Yeah, I mean, there are a few that, that United would listen to offers for. Obviously, they've had an offer from Fulham for Andreas Pereira, um, which... If, if it hasn't been accepted, will be accepted and he'll be free to talk to them and, and decide whether he wants to go. Um, Dean Henderson will probably go on loan to, to Nottingham Forest. Why do you um, think that's a loan there, Rob? So actually on that, why, why do you think that, that's a loan and not a permanent? Well, I think that is is to do with what we just mentioned about David De Gea. You know, United were very clear at the start of the summer. with Dean. Dean had gone to United and said, I want to play more games. I want to try and be in that England squad for the World Cup, which is fair enough. And United said, yeah, yeah you know, you haven't had the opportunities that you were expecting last year. Fair enough. Dean was expecting to either go permanently or on loan. And United made it very, very clear to him they only wanted it to, him to go on loan. Um, 
they have told him that there's still a chance that he is going to be United's number one. In terms of, you know, distribution and ball at his feet, his, his range of passing, he, he is a he's better at that than David De Gea. Um, he's probably, you know, fallen behind David last year because David did so well in his shot stopping um, yeah. and he saved United a, a, an awful lot of times. And once that was happening, it was very, very hard for Dean to get a look in. Um, and again, I, I think it, the case is that Eric Ten Hag has decided he's going to stick with David De Gea, but maybe in a year, maybe in two years, that he does think that Dean Henderson is a better fit for him in terms of the the way that he wants to play. Um, you know, Dean is obviously a lot longer, younger than David and has got a few more years yet. So um, there is a case where you can, you know, send Dean out on loan to Nottingham Forest, get a lot of Premier League experience, you know, hopefully getting back in the England squad and then he comes back to United and United are, or Ten Hag, sorry, is at a point where he can make that change if he wants to, that, you know, the massive holes in the squad that are there this summer aren't there anymore and he can make these little changes. So, I think it's United just covering the bases. Um, and I think that really says everything about the goalkeeping situation in that he wasn't, he hasn't been allowed to go permanently because of all the players that United were, were willing to let go this summer, he's probably the, the most sellable asset. In Absolutely. Terms of- that's that's what I was thinking. I was thinking we need yeah. to top up that kitty that you was talking about. Let's get him out for 25, 30 million. I, I think that's a lot of what a lot of people are, are thinking, a lot of United fans are particularly thinking, and you go through the squad and you think, where are you going to get this 25 million, 30 million <laughs> injection of cash? And it's him. And they've not allowed that to happen. And they've not allowed it to happen for a very specific reason in that they want him on loan and then they want him back. Wow. Um, Anthony Martial, this is a, it's a complex one because it's like, okay, you can probably come to the conclusion as a United fan that he probably don't want to be here anymore. But his stock's fallen so much because his game in the last 18 months has been so poor. The loan did not work out at all to Sevilla. If you're looking at another commodity you could sell, you could probably say a, a fit and, and fighting ready Martial could could get upwards of sort of 30, 40 million pounds if he's playing all right. Um, this version of Martial, not so much so. Are they looking to offload him or wait for deal wait for a potential suitor or is it very much actually if we didn't get Darwin Nunes we, we we might try and get an Anthony so we actually need a Martial to fill in for Ronaldo what's what's the situation with Martial do you reckon yeah I mean he's one of the ones that they would they would listen to offers for um you know, I'd put him in the same bracket as you know Eric Bailly, Wan Bissaka, Tellez, Twanzevi, um Phil Jones, Brandon Williams, all those guys. If an offer came in, they would look at it seriously. Um that's not to say they're trying to flog him to anyone because there is a space you just mentioned there that without uh, an established number nine coming in there is a space in the squad and if he was to come back and, and play as we have seen him play occasionally then yeah great come back and be a key member of the squad um the problem with a lot of these guys and it's not just a, it's not just marshall it's by and, and a few of the others the contract that he's on is just so problematic for other clubs um you know he's on the best part of 200 grand a week he's not done well at seville who's coming in for him you know, who's coming in at 30 million for him? Some very, 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 there's no, I mean, there's no money in Europe anyway. The money is in the Premier League and you look through it, which Premier League comes are coming in for him at 30 million pound? West Ham, maybe? And that's mm. a guess. Um, there isn't a massive market for him. And this is a mass, this is a problem that United have had for the last 10 years. They, they don't sell well. And you only have to look at Gabriel Jesus and, and Arsenal. You know, this he's what, 25, 26 years old. He's got one year left on his contract and City have got 45 million down plus another 10 million in bonuses. You know, really, Anthony Marshall should be worth more than that. Exactly. With with his ground and how long he's been here, yeah. No, he's, I mean, he's, you know, in terms of talent, he's, his ability on the ball, his finishing ability, the pace. Um, you know, he has done it in the Premier League. He's around the same age. You know, there, isn't, there shouldn't be any reason really on the face of it why they shouldn't be... A, selling him for 50 million pounds but no one is paying that money because they can't pay 50 million they don't think he's worth 50 million and also he's on 200 grand a week so the you know any team that could play 50 million isn't going to pay him 200 grand a week because it's too much um and he's left united in a, in a massive a massive hole and it's not just anthony marshall it's eric Bay as well um you know again you, you mentioned there about the contract he signed it's it's unbelievable really that, that he a, that he wanted to sign that contract and, and B, that United wanted him to sign it because now you, you, he's possibly stuck with a player for the next three or four years who, who isn't going to play and they can't shift. Um, and it's all very well United's kind of telling us that, you know, the budget will be supplemented by all this these outgoings and it'll be net spend and anything that, that we bring in is going to go back into the budget. Well, that's all very well, but if you're not getting anything for these players, then your budget is the same as when it started. Exactly. Um, you know, 10 million for... 
10 million euros for Andres Pereira is probably good business. But there's a danger that we're going to look back at the window in you know, early September and go, that was the best bit of business that United have done this this summer. Because at the moment, at least, you know, obviously things can change at the moment, at least, there hasn't been con- concrete interest in, in Marshall and, and Eric Bailly and, and other players like that. And that's, that's a sad state of affairs because, and I think that's the worry for a lot of Manchester United fans, me included, is where are we going to get those funds from? And like you said, Henderson was the most, you know, actual one of, of that. Didn't happen because they, they still believe he's going to be number one, which that did surprise me a little bit, actually. I thought, because I saw that there was, you know, reports that there was the 20 million obligation to buy and that got taken out. Seems like maybe Man United are the ones who who maybe who maybe took that out. Um, and you're looking at Martial, I can't see... You know, a loan doesn't really loans for these players don't really help us. They they get a space out, but it does, doesn't give us more money to get someone else in. So then you may as well keep the player. Um, so yeah, I think I just think it's like it's, it's ten years of failings, and you don't get to undo it, or you don't you don't get the opportunity to undo it. It's almost like your punishment for doing it. You know, you don't get to just have one transfer window and sort it all out. We're we're, we're stuck, and and that's I think how it's going to be. Um, for for a while. Just uh, back to uh, just quickly on Ronaldo. I forgot to ask you actually. On the captaincy situation, there's been a few reports out there today. Um, I think Simon Stone was going quite big on this, sort of saying that last year Ronaldo was at the centre of a captaincy row amongst the squad and, you know, it left Maguire feeling unhappy. I, I don't think it needed a rocket scientist to look at what was going on within that dressing room and see there was clear discontent, probably not much understanding of the leader or respect for who the leader is. It was probably all over the gaff and that's something Ten Hag has to find out and sort out. In your understanding, is there likely to be a captaincy change? Well, I mean, Ten Hag was asked about that in his first press conference and, and dodged it a little bit. You know, he, he kind did. of just focused on Harry Maguire and said, you know, he's still a great player and he's got a place in my team, that kind of thing. He kind of dodged the, the captaincy issue. Um, I mean, if, if it was me personally, I would just put it to a vote in the dressing yeah. room. You know, you remove the, the issue from yourself. Um give it to the players, let the players pick like they do at City. And then it, it, it stops it becoming a problem. Um, you know, I think you're right. You know, obviously there was a lot written last season about the the problems in the dressing room. Um, there was an issue around the captaincy and, you know, clicks in the dressing room, regardless of what the players say on social media and stuff. Th- th- there were issues in the dressing room. I think everyone can see that. You don't perform like that on the pitch if there aren't issues in the dressing room. Um, and that's one of the things that, that Ten Hag is going to have to to solve pretty quickly. Um, I think that's part of the reason that Steve McLaren is back. You know, he's a likeable guy. He's done it before. He's a good bridge between the dressing room and the management. I think the hope is that that maybe he will be able to to fix a, a few of those issues that, that were ongoing. Um, but ultimately, it's the same as everything. Look, the, these issues tend to, to come up when the team isn't winning. Um, if they can get off to a good start, you know, have a, a good atmosphere within the dressing room, win a few games, score a few goals, these issues tend to go away. I think that the problem will be is if they don't start well, um, you know, you don't start well, and and the, these issues, you know, some of these issues are, have been solved already, some of them haven't, um, and the danger is that they just kind of rear up again um, when things stop stop going well, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a real test for Ten Hag because I, you know, he's done really well at Ajax. Obviously, his record's fantastic, his reputation is is great. He was other massive clubs have looked at him. This is a, a huge job, um, not just in terms of the size of the club, but actually what he's inheriting. You know, we've, we've spent 20, mil, 20 minutes there talking about the, the squad um, and the problems within the squad and the problems bringing players in and, and bringing uh, and selling players, sorry. And that's even before you get to the issues within the dressing room. Um, this is not going to be an easy ride for, for Ten Hag. Um, it's going to be, there are going to be occasions where the board are going to have to be, well, I think the board are going to have to be quite strong and just say, look, he's our guy, we're going to stick with him. Um, obviously, the fans have got a role to play with that, in that as well, but this, is, this isn't this is going to be a, an easy transition at all. Absolutely agree with you. So it's almost like, I don't know if you've been watching the channel here, Rob, mate, honestly. Um, <laughs> and I've said, we've said many times, like, I, I personally, I know it might sound a bit pessimistic, but I can see, I can just envisage a Christmas time. It's really tough. Results have been down. That board are going to have to resist, you know, pulling the trigger, as they say. You know, I can see there's going to be a point at whatever time where we need a bit of calm. We've got battle down the hatches, as they say. The fans have got to get behind it because you know what football's like. Obviously, it's not a free pass. Managers have to show a little bit. You know, you don't get to be 14th or 13th or something like that and say, don't worry. But you have to, you have to show a little bit. But 
with what, like you said there, with what he's inheriting, it's an absolute mess. And he's, you know, apart from bringing in players and much needed quality and, and outgoings, which is obviously needed, knitting together that fractured dressing room and trying to get those players to buy in, that in itself is... <laughs> Is a, is a year's job slash 18 months, you know? And then just, like you said, changing the whole ethos of, of how they work. So, yeah, that, that's going to be that's going to be important. Um, Chris, Christian Eriksen, um, obviously, yes, Brentford on one hand, Manchester United on the other. Um, you know, when you look on social media, there's always hysteria on Twitter. It's always quite, it's always quite ridiculous sometimes. You know, when the memes are out, it's, oh, Man United can't even get a player because of, you know, Brentford or any still hasn't decided. But, you know, with what he's been through, I, I dare say there's a lot more to his decision than, than just that. But how do you understand the latest on that? Are Manchester United in a decent position to be getting him? And, and what sort of impact do you think of that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there was a, a, a case, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago where they thought that he was going to go to Spurs. Obviously, that there's that obvious link that he was there before and, um, I think United thought at that stage that that was his preferred destination. Since then, Spurs seemingly have backed away a little bit from that. Um, and it seems to be that the, the strongest interest at the moment is from Brentford and Man United. I can I, I fully understand why United fans are, are getting a little bit like, no, oh, we can't even sign a player ahead, ahead of Brentford. And I get that because on the face of it, um, it, it does look a bit silly. But you touched on it there that, you know, he's at, He's a guy who who will take an awful lot of more things into consideration when he comes up with a decision than maybe most players. Um, I'm sure you'll all know that his family has settled in London or wants to settle in London. Um, he's been through something absolutely horrific, and you know maybe you know maybe playing for a club of the prestige of Man United or the money that Man United can offer isn't the most important thing for him anymore. And I can fully understand that. You know he he was given a an opportunity by Brentford out of the blue. Um, Last season, he was their main man. He played every week. He was he was fantastic for them and kind of um, you know rebuilt his stock, I guess, in a way that people who thought that he could never do it again, he's yeah. going to show them that that he could do it again. And um, you know, aside from the fact that he wants to, or we're told that he would like to stay in London and all that, he probably does feel a little bit of loyalty to Brentford because you know that they they took a bit of a risk um, signing him and, and bringing him in and, and you know putting him back in the first team squad and giving him that. That um that chance to play Premier League football again, so you can understand it if he feels a little bit of extra loyalty to to Brentford. Um, you know that said, from United's point of view, I, I think it's 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 a sensible one because we've talked a lot there about the budget. Obviously, he's one that wouldn't come out of the budget because he's a free agent. Um, you know, his quality. You don't need me to talk about his quality because everyone will have seen it every week in the Premier League. He's a fantastic player, um, and you know, I think he's a, probably the kind of player that would do very well at, at Man United. Um, you know, they're still going to play an awful lot of games next year. They're going to play Premier League and two domestic cups in the Europa League. The Europa League is a grueling competition, particularly playing Thursday, Sunday. So there is a case that you need extra bodies in midfield, particularly when you've lost Pogba and Lingard, Mata and Matic. You know, I think in terms of that, it's probably a bit of a, a no-brainer for, for Man United, but I don't think it's set in stone that he will sign for Man United. Um, as, uh, again, look, look, I think United fans are used to Man United turning up at the door of a player and going, look, sign for us, and then, then jumping up, up like head over heels and signing straight away. I think for Ericsson, the, the decision is is maybe based on a little bit more than that. Um, uh, we would expect a decision quite soon from him, and you'd probably find out shortly what, where he's going to decide. Um, you know, obviously from a Man United point of view, I hope it's it's Old Trafford because he's a wonderful player. Um, but I, I don't think Man United are getting too carried away just yet. Yeah, definitely a no-brainer for me. Agreed on that. And uh, just to finish off, Rob, um, I know you had, um, you know, you was one of the first as well to start talking about the Rav Ranjit situation and how fractious it was and 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 what happened in the, in the fallout of him leaving and why. And, and you know, you go back to Ten Hag's first press conference. I think that gave it away straight away. I don't know whether there was, you know, a briefing or an agreement that was with um, Eric before he done his press conference to say if you're asked about Ralph. Dodge, like leave it because he literally said that's on the club like the decision had already been made from then from your understanding um what was the reasons for Ralph Ranjit leaving the club was it Eric Ten Hag coming in and saying I want to do things my way that's fine I'll speak to him on the phone but that's about it or was it more so the club and like you said his tone the way he came across and they didn't like that he was you know there was a lot some truth in a lot of what he said and they didn't like his his mannerisms I think it was a bit of both. Um, you know, even before Ten Hag was officially announced, the, there were issues behind the scenes at Man United that they didn't like some of the things that, that Ralph had said in press conferences. 
um you know they didn't like some of the the tone of what he said they, they didn't like some of the substance either um of what he said um they didn't think that pre-match press conferences were the place to to get into that there was a feeling at occasionally that it wasn't that he was answering a direct question that he used a question to get a certain point across um that that maybe he had kind of had in his head before he walked in the room yeah he would always um, do that <laughs> yeah um there was an issue around january you know randnick felt like he'd been hung out to dry a little bit in that he was led to believe that it was possible that someone would come in in january or there would be an attempt to, to sign players in january and that that didn't happen um, he felt like he wasn't helped by, you know, the likes of Marshall going. Um, you know, obviously, we, we saw what happened with Mason Greenwood as well. That he, he felt like he'd been left short-handed, and that United hadn't left the time that was left in the window to help him out, and that he kind of his reputation borne the brunt of of what happened at Man United. That you know, you know, he came in with this great reputation, or you know, United fans in particular were quite excited, and then you know, we saw it just systematically dismantled with every single defeat, um, and that he felt like United hadn't really protected him. The one comment that United didn't like above anything else was the 10 signings because they know how fractious that kind of talk is. You know, they know that United fans are, are, are annoyed when it comes to signing players and having their interim manager coming in and saying they need 10 players. And then all of, you know, Twitter and social media and the fans leaping on it going, oh, we're going to sign 10 players. You know, Ralph said we're going to sign 10 players. United knew at that point they weren't going to sign 10 players and, and they were unimpressed that he had kind of suggested that that might happen because they felt that he knew that that was never going to happen. So there was all that that was going on anyway. That was bubbling. Um, and then when when Ten Hag came in, I think he was quite... I think he was a lot harder in negotiations about the job than perhaps United were expecting. Um, you know, he was very, very clear about the the role that he wanted within transfers, the players that came in and recruitment. He was happy to work with with John Murtagh and his team. But Ralph Randnick at that time was a little bit of a wild card in that that consultancy role hadn't really been defined particularly well. It was just like, oh, he's going to be a consultant. It's like, well, okay, but what does that... What does that yeah, mean? What is, do? Yeah, what is it? What's he going to do? Um, so he was a little bit nervous about that. Um, and then when it came to the crunch, we're talking, you know, maybe two weeks before the end of the season, particularly the week that led up to the Crystal Palace game. Um, Ten Hag was obviously at the Palace game. I think Radnick felt that that there would be this sort of big handover where they would sit down face to face and Radnick would go through one by one and say, look, this is what I think about this player and this is what I think about it. You need to be signing this guy and this guy and I would advise you to sign this guy. And Ten Hag had already said, no, 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 that's not happening. You can have a phone call. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to meet him face to face. Yeah, out of courtesy, you oh, can have a phone call. Only voice notes. <laughs> yeah, we can we can talk about you know whatever you want to talk about, but it's a phone call and then see you later. Randnick was particularly unimpressed with that. And then obviously he'd already taken the the Austria job and um, the communication between Ten Hag and, and Murtar and, and Randnick had already broken down to the point where it was just, it seemed sensible at that point to say, Look, there's there's no point dragging this out. Um, I think it's best if if you know we part, we have a clean break, and and you go, we go our separate ways. I don't think it's a case that Ten Hag came in and went, I'm not coming unless he's it, unless he goes. I think it was a build up of things. United were already a little bit frustrated about some of the stuff that had happened. Um, the communication even before Ten Hag wasn't great. Again, Randnick wasn't happy with with the handover that he was given with with Ten Hag, and I think it just got to a point where for everyone concerned, it was best that that they uh, parted company. Yeah, it was ended up quite toxic, like a lot of uh, Manchester United relationships end up. Um, something that we've got to, we've got to fix. Uh, listen, guys, we've we've really enjoyed that, Rob. Thank you so much for that. Um, ESPN's Manchester United correspondent um, is link is in the video description below for all of his socials as well. So check him out on Twitter and all other socials as well to get your latest Manchester United transfer news and more. Rob, thank you so much for coming on for the channel, man. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no worries, guys. Smash the like on the video and subscribe if you're new. If you want to see Rob back again, let us know. I'm sure we can organise it um, and be a guest on the channel once again. We are out of here, guys. Take care. Peace.